Tonight, Waikato Expressway gets billion dollar boost, Mercy Ship Extraordinaire and Women's Refuge Workers Stay Strong. Kia ora and good evening. Welcome to Central News on TV Central for Tuesday the 10th of March. I'm Amanda Harper. In today's news, work on the final three sections of the Waikato Expressway will get underway this year after receiving the go-ahead from the New Zealand Transport Agency Board. The board has approved $1.08 billion to fund construction of the Hamilton and Long Swamp sections of the expressway. The TA's Waikato and Bay of Plenty Regional Director, Harry Wilson, says the green light from the board meant that all seven sections of the expressway will be built, be under construction or put out to tender by the end of 2015. The Waikato Expressway is one of seven roads of national significance, identified by the government as key to unlocking New Zealand's potential for economic growth. Somebody from Madagascar walked for three days to have a life-threatening 7.4 kg tumour removed from his cheek by medical staff on board a Mercy ship. Janine Boys from Matamata volunteers aboard that ship and says his quality of life has not only improved, but that he was likely to have died from his condition. For a start, he doesn't have this thing hanging off the side of his head, just weighing him down. His uh, risk of dying in the next six months has probably almost completely disappeared. Uh, I remember seeing the photos of him before he had surgery and afterwards and you could see the struggle and the battle that he'd been living through in his eyes beforehand and afterwards you can see the relief and the hope and just, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, still going to be here on this earth in six months time. So it must be just massive. We will have more from Janine later on in the show. Soccer team YBOP United threw a spanner in the works of Hawke's Bay United's playoff push with a dramatic late winner, providing a 1-0 victory at Blue Water Stadium in Napier on Sunday. With the playoff berth just minutes away for the home side, Federico Marquez fired beyond Hawke's Bay goalkeeper Josh Hill in the 90th minute to force the home side into a three-way battle for the playoffs next weekend. Hawke's Bay will secure their playoff spot with a point in next Sunday's home match with Canterbury United, but defeat could see Waitakere United and the Wellington Phoenix leapfrog the side currently in third place. Persistence has paid off for a Mount Monganui man who was reunited with his stolen pixie caravan yesterday. Police converged on a storage unit in Papamoa East after locating Jonas Ruff's beloved caravan, which was stolen in the early hours between Monday and Tuesday last week. The theft left Jonas appealing to the public for vital information about the caravan's whereabouts and the German expat included a $1,000 reward. Jonas says he never gave up hope and kept using social media to appeal to anyone who might have seen it. Jonas's online appeal went viral and he also posted flyers around Mount Monganui. And now for our region's weather. Hamilton expect fine spells, showers developing in the afternoon with light winds. High of 27 and overnight low of 14. The rest of the Waikato will be mostly the same. Pairo 26 high, 15 low, Matamata 24 and 15, Te Aomotu you will get up to 27 with an overnight low of 14 and Tokoroa 24 high, 14 low. Tauranga you will have rain, a few showers are developing in the afternoon, high of 25 and low of 17. For other parts of the bay expect the same, Mr Puki, your high is 23 and overnight low of 16. And for the marine forecast, on the west coast Raglan, southwest rising to 15 knots in the morning with a sea slight. Southwest swell to 2 metres at times. High tide is at 2.28pm. And on the east coast, Bay of Plenty, variable 10 knots, sea slight, northeast swell of 1 metre. Your high tide is at 11.54am. Coming up, Hillary talks business with the Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to Central News, I'm Amanda Harper. At the heart of business confidence in the Bay is the Tauranga Chamber of Commerce. Hillary speaks with Anne Pankhurst. 
People are mobile now. They, they choose where they want to work, they follow their dream. It's, there isn't that sense, a career is no longer starting at a business at 17, 18, 19, 20 and staying there for the next 40, 50, 60 years. In fact, if that happened, you would look at their CV and go, why didn't you change? Why didn't you move up the ladder? Why didn't you follow a career path that actually added to your skills, not just kept them the same? So if that's happening, the people, younger people now look at that and go, well, I will, I'll go to England, I'll go to the BBC and get my experience. I will go and work anywhere in the world because I can and not because they are restricted to living in their place. And New Zealanders by nature are nomads. We, um, we leave the country to gain what we consider appropriate experience and skills and then bring them back often when you want to settle down with your family because it's a beautiful place to live. But that that's what makes those skills hard to keep. So you, when employers are looking at that, they're not just saying, well, I'll give you the minimum wage or I'll just pay you this amount of money. That It's a whole package now. Why would I want to live here? Why would I want to bring my family here? What career choices do I have? So if you look at the size and scale of businesses in the Bay, we've still got to grow that depth. So there's not that many top echelon higher management until the tertiary precinct arrives. There isn't that whole research capability. There's a whole series of things that are impacting on that career choice. And that's why we sometimes struggle to get that. Like I said, it's changing, but that is a slow moving change. Do you think it's still a case of small town playing at being a big city? Absolutely. We're, we're just at the point of a teenage boy pulling on his long pants. We haven't quite got there yet. We're still, we know we can get there. We know we're going to grow. And we're just at that point of the tipping point. We're not quite at the tipping point where um, it's still a wonderful place to come and people will come here. But I really, really, they're still really investigating it and doing their due diligence. And an example, I met a lady last week from the Bahamas, very keen to come back home, bring her children home, bring them up in New Zealand, um, give them good education. So she was looking at two places, and one was Auckland and one was Tauranga. And so she could see the benefit around the lifestyle here for herself and her children and her husband. But was the business here? Was the, the career choice here? Was the growth here? Of course I did everything I, I could to bring her here because I think it's wonderful that she considers us. But that is that example, you know, when you're up against a place like Auckland, you suddenly see this, the difference in size and scale. All you can really, or what I tried to promote, was the, the opportunity and really build around that lifestyle. But it's not always enough. You've got to think, well, I want to make a really good income. Why would I not go to Auckland? We all know the answer, but we live here. How do we let go of that stigma then of $10 tauranga? Well, hopefully now that the minimum wage is fourteen seventy-five, everyone lifts. But um, I think there is, you know, Priority One Chamber have been doing a lot of work in this area to try and build that that capacity and that capability. Definitely now that places like Brother have bought their big business here, the Tauriko business estate is showing big businesses arriving in the city. The port is, and the closeness to the port and the logistics and the roading network has helped enormously. Um, I do think there, if there's one area that we're probably still behind the eight ball and that is that cultural amenity. You know, those highly skilled people don't just come here to go to the beach. They want to go to a museum, they want to see good theatre, they want to have concerts available. And so those things really impact on what the, that decision. And, and it ultimately, it will change, but it's, we're still sort of thinking small town, trying to grow into a big town, and we're not quite making those two decisions match. For more information on how the Chamber can help you, head to www.tauranga.org.nz.
This week, Central News got the pleasure of sitting down with Matamata local Janine Boys. Born and bred in the town, but she hasn't lived here for years. In fact, she hasn't really lived in any town. She lives on a ship, but not just any ship. What Mercy Ships does is it goes to different countries, usually around Africa or around the African region, and we bring hope and healing to the forgotten poor. So we get invited into a country and we uh, perform free surgeries for anybody that we can help. Okay. And what is your role on the ship? My role is uh, that of purser. Most people ask, what does a purser do? <laughs> I'm still finding out. Uh, I haven't been in that role for an awful long time. Pretty much I look after the logistics of the ship, so customs, immigration, anything and anyone that comes to the ship tends to go through my office. Now, I understand your role is purely voluntary, mm -hmm. but you also have to pay as well. So how does that work? Okay, uh, we've got over 400 crew members on the ship and we're all volunteers. So not only, yes, do we have to find our own funding and, and sponsorship, but yes, we have to pay for our room and board. Uh, so otherwise, Mercy Ships would have to pay for us to be there and then we wouldn't be able to provide free, free surgeries to the local people as well as we can. And how long have you been a volunteer? Uh, just over five years now. So what is it that makes you do it for so long? Uh, I just think it's where I'm called to be. Um, it's a wonderful place to be and it's just, it's a, just an awesome thing to do. Um, and I get inspired every single day because there's just wonderful things going on all the time. So you really haven't actually been paid for the last five years? No, I haven't been paid for the last five years, no. <laughs> Not in money anyway, but in so much more. Uh, yes, absolutely. And you kind of just get used to it. It's actually can be quite humbling. Yeah. Now, I understand you have just gotten, gotten back from Madagascar for a bit of a holiday. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about what's going on there? Okay, in Madagascar, we got there uh, about, around about the uh, end of October. And we will be there until about June this year. And we've been uh, there doing surgeries for, for several months uh, and then we'll be going to uh, South Africa for a couple of months to um, do some ship maintenance then we come back for another t uh, 10 month field service mm -hmm. in Madagascar so we'll continue on with our surgeries. Our surgeries will change a little bit because Madagascar has different requirements to other African countries that we've been to. Each country has different needs. Um, like in Madagascar we don't need to run our eye program quite so much because they don't have as much need for cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. However, um, women's gynecological uh, issues uh, are, are huge in Madagascar. So we actually have to do a lot more surgeries there, so we'll be ramping up that program. Okay. Now I understand there's also quite a unique case of a chap called Sambani? Yes, yes. Sambani, yes. Wonderful, wonderful gentleman. Uh, just two days before I left the ship to come home on, on holiday, uh, a gentleman uh, was uh, on the ship and he had a 12 hour surgery on the ship which is pretty huge. It was actually a Kiwi lady um, that was actually involved in the surgery. She was, a, she was an operating room nurse and he had a tumour grown out of his neck. It was, it was absolutely massive. Uh, I think it is actually the biggest one that we've ever seen. Uh, it ended up weighing about seven and a half kgs which is huge. It's about the size of your head or even bigger. So it was actually quite a risk to uh, put him through that surgery. However, it is the opinion of, the, of our chief medical officer, the surgeon that actually performed the, surgeon, the, the, uh, the surgery, that he probably would have died within maybe six months if he hadn't have had the surgery. Yeah. So he would have maybe suffocated or just something else, complications would have set in. But he's been carrying that around for, I think, 19 years. That is a long time. It is, it's a long time. Yeah, we'll be back with more about Sambani after the break. Welcome back to Central News. I'm here with Janine from Mercy Ships and she's telling me about Sambani. Now can you please tell me how his quality of life has improved since the surgery? I would imagine that it has improved hugely. For a start he doesn't have this thing hanging off the side of his head just weighing him down. His uh, risk of dying in the next six months has probably almost completely disappeared. Uh, I remember seeing the photos of him before he had surgery and afterwards 
and you could see the struggle and the battle that he'd been living through in his eyes beforehand and afterwards you can see the relief and the hope and just, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, still going to be here on this earth in six months' time. So it must be just massive. So he can finally actually have a life. He can have a life, yes. He hasn't got that thing constantly weighing him down. And it's huge. It is, it is massive. It, it's, it's just unbelievable. So if it wasn't for Mercy Ships, he would possibly be dead or dying? Pretty much, yes, because unfortunately uh, Madagascar, like many countries that we visit, just doesn't have the facility, the medical facilities there to perform that surgery and or he wouldn't have the money to actually get that treatment even if it was available, which is what we normally um, see, which is what we, we fill that gap. Now I know with your role you don't deal with the patients directly, but you do hear about their stories. Mm -hmm. Is that what motivates you to keep going? Pretty much, yes. I, I hear about uh, some of the things that go on in the hospital. Part of the ship was just, which is just two decks low before my off, uh, below my office, because uh, wonderful things go on there all day long. Many of which we don't see or hear, but the ones that we are fortunate enough to hear just uh, gets me every time. I'm fortunate enough where I can actually, uh, I actually take tours of the ship for some of the officials that I deal with through Customs and Immigration and our shipping agents. So I actually take them on a tour of the hospital as well. And that just, if you like, reignites my passion for what I do and why I'm there, which is just wonderful. How many operating theatres are actually in the ship? At the moment, I believe there's four and they're state of the art operating theatres. We're very fortunate that we do have uh, lots of um, donors, lots of medical donors as well that actually uh, provide um, our state-of-the-art equipment, which is fantastic, which means the people that we can help get the best care that we can get, that we can give them. Yeah. And how are patients screened? Like, how do you become one of the lucky ones to get help? When uh, the previous country that we were in, which is Republic of Congo, which is in West Central Africa, that's where we were last year. Uh, we did uh, our normal screening there, and we advertise quite a well, in, quite a way in advance. Lots of radio advertising and word of mouth. So people come for hundreds of miles or thousands of miles. It may take them several days to get there. They come to a central location in the Congo. It was a school, and most of the crew go along and help with registration, security, crowd control, escorting the patients. So they may wait in line for several hours or from the night before. And we have all our surgeons there as well, and they uh, screen them to see who, who we can help. There's lots of people we can help, unfortunately, there's also many that we cannot. Janine's story is absolutely fascinating. We will have more from her coming up in the next few days. In our last story, women's refuge are there to help women from abusive relationships, but often they are on the receiving end of abuse themselves. Well, essentially it happens over the phone. Um, we are getting up to five abusive calls a week, um, sometimes, sometimes more, um, around um, needing services and not being, um, us not being prepared to offer those services to those families because they don't meet our criteria. So it's um, usually families who need accommodation um, and we're not able to help. Uh, but then we do also have the occasional woman who refuses to give us any information and of course we're, we're needing to do um, you know, a full assessment to see whether they meet the criteria to come into refuge. Um, they're becoming abusive at that point. Do you think there is a misunderstanding out there or is this just people are simply desperate? Oh, it's a bit of both, I think. People are very desperate. Our city does not have anywhere um, for women and children to go um, in emergency homeless shelters. Um, we have a homeless shelter, which is wonderful for our men, but our, our women and children try and stay under the radar of child, youth and family and try and try not to uh, basically you know, be obviously homeless. Uh, so those women are really desperate for homes. And then there's the other group of women who are um, essentially unhappy with the answer that we give them around, around not being able to come into refuge. Uh, we still can offer them to be community clients, so we do work with community clients, but um, yeah, the immediate housing it seems to be a serious issue here. 
If a woman is left homeless and she's got children, she can't literally has no roof over their head. What are her options? Well, unfortunately, there are very few options in our city. We um, have a few um, places where they can get um, shelter, and those are places like camping grounds and backpackers. These are places that we don't necessarily think are good places, good family environments for women um, and children. Often um, some of our men who um, are on bail are bailed to these kinds of places. So it's essentially not the best option, but we really don't have uh, anywhere. We have some mid-term options for people, but emergency, immediate crisis um, homes, we have nothing. What do you think needs to be done? Well, certainly I think that um, Tauranga City Council needs to take some responsibility and look at um, creating um, or offering a, a premises for these families. I know in the past we've had them and they've been closed because of the difficulties with management of those. Um, and those services were fabulous. We had families going there in the past. Um, I do think there needs to be a city-wide um, response to homelessness for our families. As I say, those families, they're not as obvious as our, our um, rough sleeping men or our homeless men because they're not, um, you know, they're not on the streets, they're hiding, um, they're in cars. Uh, we really need to do something to support these families. Unfortunately, refuge can't take those women. What are the rules then? Um, for you guys to be able to take someone into a safe house? Well, it's um, it's around immediate safety, so that um, woman and her children need to be protected from uh, domestic violence and put in a safe, violence-free environment. So they can't, um, if they're homeless, um, and it's not to do with domestic violence, then we can't help them. We only have beds for 10 women and children at any given time and we have 176,000 people who we service with 10, those 10 beds. So we have to be really strict, and you know, it's horrible. It is horrible to turn families away and not have options for them. Um, but at the same time, um, we have a criteria, we have to stick to it, and my staff do not deserve to be abused because of that. Um, and they have been given permission, my staff have been given permission to absolutely uh, give one warning and hang up if it continues. It is awful abuse and uh, we're all about um, being violence free and that includes for my staff. I can't imagine it's an easy job. All the workers at all women's refuges around the country should definitely be commended. That is it from me tonight. To stay up to date with all that we do, like us on Facebook. Search centralnews.tv or if you think you may have a story lead or perhaps feedback about the show, email news at tvcentral.co.nz. I will be back on screens tomorrow night with more stories from the Waikato and the Bay of Plenty. My name is Amanda Harper. Have a good evening. Paul Marie. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.